There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you to America's top museums to talk to the experts. Then we go behind the scenes to learn even more. We're at the breathtaking Ringling Estate, overlooking Sarasota Bay in Sarasota, Florida, at the famous Circus Museum. The name Ringling is synonymous with the golden days of the circus world. John Ringling and his brothers created the greatest show on earth, and by the Roaring Twenties, he had become one of the richest men in America, with an estimated worth of over $200 million. During his travels throughout Europe looking for circus acts, he and his wife Mabel amassed an impressive art collection that included works by many of the old masters, such as Van Dyck, Rubens, and El Greco, among others. In 1931, the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art opened to the public on this spectacular property. Today, we're going to learn more about this American entrepreneur known as the King of the Circus and his incredibly popular form of entertainment that would cross the country in a 100 rail car caravan every season. Then we'll go behind the scenes into the museum's private conservation lab to see historic artifacts from the Ringling Collection that are not on view to the public. So are you ready to run away to the circus? Let's go. Stephen, you've got to tell me about this incredible estate. I've never been anywhere like this. Yes, the Ringling is really an extraordinary experience here. It's a, a unique museum in this country. Well, I think John Ringling's life was pretty unique also, and I think his yeah. tastes were unique, and the brothers. Tell me a little bit about how that all started. So he came and visited. He was living up in New York, and uh, came down and visited a local family here and decided to buy property in uh, 1911. And then he decided to start building a house uh, that caught us on in the 20s. And at a roughly the same time, he decided he and Mabel wanted to leave a legacy uh, to the people of Florida. And so he decided to create this art museum. And in six years, from about 1925 to 1931, he not only hired an architect to design the art museum, he also began buying art. So he had been collecting a little bit on the side, but he seriously started buying work. And over that period of time, he bought about 800 European uh, paintings and works on paper. And he also acquired about 2,000 pieces of Cypriot art from the Metropolitan Museum when they okay. were deaccessioning it. Tell us what it. Cypriot art it's, is. It's uh, uh, sculptures from Cyprus from about 500 BC. So we have 66 acres and we have uh, our grounds are an arboretum. Uh, we have over 200 species of trees and uh, hundreds and hundreds of wooded shrubs here on the, on the grounds. But then we also have the Art Museum, yes. which is phenomenal. The original 21 galleries that really have some wonderful works from Renaissance and the Baroque period, one of the best collections uh, in the United States. And then we also have just recently opened a Center for Asian Art uh, that will soon be featuring the Cypriot works as well. And then we've also opened an, another area for our contemporary collection. So our collections in, in the arts go from 500 BC uh, up until uh, today. Uh, of course, then you have the house, the Katazan, which Let's is... Let's talk about that. It's That's considered, quite a house. Yeah. How would you call it a house? <laughs> yes, it is. A, it's an amazing building. Oh, and yeah. The house was designed uh, by Dwight Baum, New York architect. And then uh, he had Ralph Twitchell uh, come down and be the architect on site here. 
And so they created this, this building, which is kind of a pastiche of Venetian architecture. Yeah. I mean, overlooking the water, it is yeah. stunning. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful place, beautiful views of the Sarasota Bay from there. So what can folks expect when they come into the Circus Museum? It was our first director here, Chick Austin, who came here from the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Connecticut and began developing this property here. And he d noticed all of this circus material that was around and available, and he began assembling it. And then he took the garage, which was John Ringling's original garage, and converted that into what is uh, the first circus museum in the United States in the late 1940s. So that's where it really began. And since that point, the circus museum has continued to grow and we have two totally different buildings that document it. And, and circus continues yeah. too. So it's, it's a wonderful uh, art form, a, a wonderful uh, media, and uh, it's something we're very proud to host here. So let's talk about the relationship between P.T. Barnum and the Ringling Brothers. Sure, so the Ringling Brothers really admired Barnum and his partners. They built themselves out from a small show in Wisconsin, sticking west of the Mississippi, so they weren't stepping on the toes of Barnum and Bailey. And then after Barnum passed in 1891, James Bailey, who was a tremendous businessman as well, saw an opportunity to expand audiences and took the Barnum and Bailey show abroad to Europe for seven years. And so while Barnum and Bailey was touring abroad, the Ringlings brought their show east of the Mississippi and built out a name for themselves. And when James Bailey came back in 1903, he found formidable competition. And being a smart businessman himself, he partnered with the Ringlings. And so the Ringlings at that moment knew they'd made big time. They were partners with Bailey. Uh, and then a year later, Bailey died. And again, seizing that opportunity, they went in and bought the Barnum and Bailey Greatest Show on Earth circus title from the Bailey family. They decided to combine the shows into the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey show that we know now. Well, let's talk about the logistics of, I mean, obviously when they started in Wisconsin and you said it was three rings, I'm assuming they had animals then too. I mean, how were they figuring this out as they were traveling around, forget Europe, I mean, traveling around the United States? Sure. Uh, that was one place where the Ringlings were very smart because they started small. So their initial troupe were just human performers. And then every couple of years they would add some animals. Horses, first one out because they could also help pull wagons. And then they had to add an elephant, right? Because at that era, what was a circus without an elephant? So in the late 1880s, they added their first elephant and then slowly grew those abilities. Uh, they were traveling overland by wagon for the first five or six years, and then eventually moved on to the railroad cars. And that's when a circus could grow really big. Um, so they, they built up slowly you know, taking their time for all of that and taking their cues from men like Barnum and Bailey who had figured it all out before. During the heyday of the tented circus in America, the circus added rings and enlarged the seating capacity of the big top to incredible proportions. These colossal canvas cities drew thousands of people from miles around, but before there could be a performance, the huge wooden poles had to be placed and the canvas unfolded. Where just the day before there was an open field, the area teemed with activity which transformed the vacant lot into a magical wonderland. But just as quickly as it arrived, the circus would disappear. Before the day was over, all of the performing clowns and props and animals and tents, rigging and people, would be again loaded on the train and off to the next day's performance. The complex organization that allowed the circus to crisscross the country was a logistical miracle watched as closely by the military as by circus fans. Did I hear something that the government tapped Ringling at one point for logistical help with the military? So it's interesting. There's a lot of stories that fly around about the military observing the circus. There is some evidence that the U.S. government was interested in, in how they moved people, but we do know that the German army, prior to World War I, went out and observed the Barnum and Bailey show in while Europe. they were in Europe because the circus could move thousands of people every single day, set up a whole city of canvas, and be ready to go for a show. So 
no military could function like that in that era. One of the highlights of the collection here is the Howard Brothers Circus model, and it was made by Howard Tibbles. He began building this model at the age of 17, which is phenomenal in and of itself. Coincidentally, that was the same year that Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey stopped touring under canvas, so it became this beautiful document of the tented era. It is over 3,800 square feet of miniature circus, uh, which is hard to fathom. It has around 50,000 individual pieces within the model, all of which have been cataloged and photographed along the way. And Howard's still adding to it, actually. Just a few months ago, he put in another wagon. So, oh my goodness. But he built it, you're right, as a map of the logistics of the circus day, because his engineering mind wanted to figure out how did they move all of these people every day, put on two shows, pack up, and be in the next town tomorrow. So. You see all of the tents that had to be set up, the whole process of the circus day carried out across the model. We've heard how the circus moves. Let's talk about how John Ringling used to move from location to location. So one of the treasures of our collection is the Wisconsin Railroad car. And that was John Ringling's private Pullman car. It's a beautiful object in itself. It is also a wonderful symbol of what John Ringling had achieved. So he commissioned the Wisconsin from the Pullman Company. He got the car in 1905 and he used it to travel across the country. So he would la put the car at the end of a railroad that was heading off a business line and would travel from place to place. When you look inside the car, you can see the kind of luxury that he enjoyed, and he was one of very few Americans at that time to have their own private car. I think it's less than 20 individuals who weren't already associated with a railroad that had um, private cars of their own. And he had it equipped with a wonderful kitchen. There is then the, the serv servants' quarters, which for most people would have had two staff traveling and sleeping with the car. John didn't see the need for two. He had one man, Taylor Gordon, who traveled with him most of the Lucky time. Lucky Mabel. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, she actually, Mabel had her own stateroom. John had his own, which is, is this extraordinary space with a very large bed because he was a tall man. Mabel's stateroom is right next door and she had an upper berth so that when her family traveled with her, she could have them on board. Um, and she traveled frequently with John, but not all the time. She would go uh, spend time at the Katazan or spend time with family. Uh, but the, the car was made to be a home on wheels. In 1927, John Ringling had brought winter quarters of Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey to Sarasota. He saw it as an opportunity, one, to have the show rehearse in warm weather instead of Bridgeport <laughs> winters. Yeah. Um, so there was that, but he also saw it as an opportunity to, to build tourist markets. So people were invited to come watch performances at winter quarters. When that closed in the late 60s, a lot of the pieces of circus, of the circus logistics, of the costumes and spectacle were left there or were within the circus community that still resides here. So our collections grew from that. Uh, the Five Graces bandwagon, which we are standing this in front is gorgeous. of, is uh, one of the pieces that is dearest to my heart, frankly. This bandwagon was built in 1878 for the Adam Forepaw Circus. It would go on to tour Europe with Barnum and Bailey, and then ultimately come to Sarasota as part of the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey assets. When it traveled with Barnum and Bailey, it would have been gilded. So you have to imagine Whoa, really? this beautiful wagon, all gilded, glistening, and glittering, yes. as it was pulled by 40 horses down the street. Um, it, that would stretch the length of this building and beyond. So the, the, the spectacle of this and the power and the show of, of just luxury. That Even the today to, to see that. I mean, what we see on our phones is incredible and what we see in a movie theater, but to see something live like that, it yes. had to have been. With a band playing on top. With a band on top. Add, because that, that adds to the whole experience of it. So. It's really unbelievable. And, I, and I'm looking at the wheels and I know you have a collection of just the wheels. The wheels are works of art. Again, there were so many really fine crafts that went into staging the circus and they, they appreciated those elements. So the, the wheels that we have come right again from winter quarters 
and there are photos of the artists working on these. They would build them out and we, we have an idea of the process of how they would build them together because they had to be sturdy enough to carry these wagons that were many tons. So the steel rims on the outside hold it all together and then they each have unique sunburst patterns painted on them. Nothing is quite like the cannon truck that we have in the galleries because that is the, the object that propelled people. And that one actually could shoot two performers out in succession, one, two, um, <laughs> flying across outdoor spaces because the, the kind of a trajectory you would see with that wagon was much bigger than a building could accommodate. And so the zucchinis used that on the Ringling Show and then other fair dates and, and circus dates. They were one of the group of people who settled here in Sarasota, and so they brought us that wonderful wagon to take care of and to share with visitors. Even the ticket booth was beautiful. I mean, there's nothing that there wasn't attention paid to. Exactly, yeah. and inside the ticket wagon that we have, which again is from the early 20th century, that was built for the Ringling Brothers, and much of it was restored here on site by artists who had worked with at the winter quarters. And inside you can see the decorative painting on the ceiling tiles. That wagon would have been locked solid on the circus lot because it held the money. Sure. Yeah. So only the front windows would have been open to allow for the sales of tickets. And one thing we can't do in the circus galleries is dig out the front wheels on the lot. They would have actually dug a rut and rolled it oh, in. Oh, so they couldn't roll it away? So it couldn't be rolled away, but also to bring the front nose down just a little bit to make it easier to do transactions with oh people selling gosh. tickets. So um, those are the kind of nuances of the circus lot that it's hard to recreate in the galleries. But still, it's very realistic. Yes, yes. Now, obviously, posters are a big part of the collection. There are some stunning posters. I mean, I'm a poster collector myself and I have my eye on a few of those. They are gorgeous. Right, the, the museum collection, which house, includes the Tibbles collection of posters, now numbers over 8,000 oh circus posters, right? And, and they're fragile, but they're in good condition. They're incredibly fragile. They're ephemeral material. They sure. were never meant to last. So they're printed on a news pulp, basically. So two weeks before the circus would show up, they would start papering the towns with these colorful prints, and they would buy them by the tens of thousands from the print companies. So they're, they really drove the market and really innovated a lot of the printing techniques that were taking place in cities like Cincinnati and Buffalo, New York. Yeah, that I believe. Now, I also noticed that, that there's a space that's very interactive. I'm seeing kids squeeze into a clown car, putting makeup on, typewriter walking. Let's talk about that section of the museum. It's incredible. The circus is such a complex topic and we spend a lot of time on the business of it, you know, talking about the Ringling Brothers and how they got there, how the circus moved. All of that is really important and interesting, but at the heart of the circus is performance. Yeah. And at the heart of performance is movement. So it was really important to us in the galleries where we get to share the stories of performers that people get to get an idea of what it would be like if you were the clown Lou Jacobs whose, whose car is on display and you were over six feet tall, how did you squeeze yourself into that tiny exactly. car? Um, and so we, we have a model, a replica of it that our visitors are able to try for themselves. A, a small clue, it's actually a little bit bigger than Lou's car was because we wanted to make sure people could feel comfortable getting in and out of or that Or that you wouldn't car. have to be getting them out. <laughs> there was a little concern about that. Um, well, and that makeup table I thought was really interesting too, and I saw a whole family there. Yes. You know, they were all working on that. that Video, it, it's a video there with Chuck Sidlow. He is a, a clown who performed with Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey and is a member of our community still. And he provided that video, which is an overview of how he put on his clown face. And he interweaves a history of clowning in that conversation. And people will sit and watch, I think it's a seven minute long video. It's, it's a commitment of time and people love it. As P.T. Barnum once said, elephants and clowns are the pegs upon which circuses are hung. With their comic capers, clowns are a critical component of the circus, performing in rings, on the hippodrome track, and in the stands, clowns of all kinds fill the circus with their mischievous antics and stunts. Uh, May Worth's costume is on display. May Worth was a bareback rider uh, in the States. She came over in 1915 from Australia and she could do backward somersaults from the back of one galloping horse to another. Oh, yeah. right. Just amazing feats that she could accomplish. But her, her riding gown is this beautiful, simple silk piece. Uh, it's lovely and dainty, and you would never imagine the powerhouse that was behind it. 
daring and skilled performers who amaze the audience are the cornerstones of circus performance. Daredevil acts like the human cannonball and the wheel of death incorporate large dramatic props and capitalize on the tension that builds as the audience thrills at the performer's bravery and skill. Tell me about this huge mural that's in the front hall. It's stunning. Yes. Yes. The, the Greatest Show on Earth mural, which was painted by William Woodward, was actually commissioned by Feld Entertainment, who were at that time the owners of Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey's Circus. They had bought it from the Ringling family. And they commissioned that extraordinary mural for the entryway into their corporate offices in Virginia. It's one thing that makes this place special is that multiple generations can come and can share their stories with one another. Absolutely. This is such an interesting space. Where are we, Barbara? We are in the conservation laboratory of the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art. I can't imagine the responsibility and what comes in. It is daunting. I mean, the collections are diverse yes. and there are many uh, fine art objects, all kinds of artifacts, objects of all kinds, and also the architecture we're responsible for. Oh my goodness. So tell me what we're looking at here. Well, we are in the uh, sculpture and decorative arts section. Our conservator of sculpture and decorative arts is working on these objects. They have been requested for loan by um, an organization in Montreal, Canada. Okay. And these will be going out in the next few months, um, traveling up to Montreal for the exhibition. So this is obviously a costume of some kind? These are all circus objects of various kinds. There are circus costumes that were worn by performers. Nice. Um, there are clown shoes. There are uh, various large size heads, There's a range of different types of objects great. that would be part of the performances of, of circus. So these are all pieces that are normally in the Ringling Collection. However, if they are going to be going on view in the museum or going elsewhere, they come in here just to be prepped, kind of? Or? Yes, well, in, in the conservation lab, we do the, the examination of the works of the objects. We do documentation, uh, technical photography. We'll identify the condition of the objects and identify what kind of problems they've had and why they've deteriorated. And then we'll work out a treatment plan. So it, the conservation that will be required to stabilize the objects and to improve their appearance. So you're like a sleuth almost, and then you're yes. a surgeon. Yes, we have to be all of those things. <laughs> you have to be all of them. And then if you have materials such as this head, I mean, when they come to the museum, would they have been stored just anywhere? I mean, there could be water damage or... There could be quite extensive damage. And often we, we do not acquire works that are in really poor condition. Oh, okay. There are exceptions, but also we, we try to store things safely so that we prevent further damage. A lot of what we do is preventing damage and then cons doing conservation treatment when it's necessary. I see. Mm -hmm. And many pieces will probably never be on view, I would assume. There are many that are in, kept in storage, yeah. and that's why we, we uh, really do appreciate the opportunities when works are requested for, for loan. Yeah. It gives the opportunity for many more people to, to view them oh, in yeah, exhibitions. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So if you're responsible for all these different collections, do you also do conservation on fine art pieces? Yes, and I am actually a, a painting conservation specialist. Oh my goodness. And we have a large collection of paintings at the Museum of Art, and there are a number of big projects that are underway at the moment. Well, the watermelon regatta is an amazing painting. It's a very, has very unusual subject matter. It's painted, it's Italian, painted around uh, 1700. And it's really quite remarkable in terms of uh, the subject. And its condition is rather poor, but it was decided that it, there was enough of the original left to continue with a major treatment, which has continued over several years. So when you're doing something like that, what materials do you use? Materials of the day or? Well, when there's been a loss of the original oil paint, you do not use the oil paint to, to uh, in paint or retouch because that paint will discolor, it'll become more difficult to remove. So we normally use a synthetic resin. There are a range of different materials we can use. We mix either mix that with uh, powder pigments or there are some conservation materials that have the pigment mixed with the, the resin already. Well, we'll have to look for that when it actually goes on display. And in the meantime, I guess we can say bon voyage to these pieces. <laughs> well, yes, well, they do have some treatment that's required before they're, they're packed up, but uh, this is all part of the process.
John Ringling and his wife Mabel shared a love for Florida, fine art, and of course the circus world they created. Thankfully, we can all enjoy the fruits of their passion through one of America's premier cultural collections that show us the rich history of this popular form of entertainment known as the circus. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time.